Welcome, welcome. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Have a seat. Oh, so, what? yeah, I've got your book up here. And mine got post-it notes. Yeah, mine came with fancy post-it notes. Are you getting graded later? I, maybe. I don't Let's know. grade him later. <laughs> Um, gosh, so your your resume has been all over the place, and I, I don't think I have actually talked to anybody who's had as much um, internet specific stardom. People have become stars and then gotten famous on the internet, and you kind of flipped the bit on that, which has been very cool. I guess so. I have a weird pathway that I don't know if other people have could du du could duplicate, but at the same time, I I wrote the book because I thought there were some universal things in in my book that I thought people could take away, um, and hopefully just embrace who they are a little bit more. That's kind of the theme of my book because I got where I am and did the things I did because I just kind of followed the weird paths life took me. Well, yeah, for I guess for those who don't know, I didn't actually introduce the book. You're never weird on the internet. Almost a right memoir there. by Felicia Day, <laughs> right here. I will the forward by Joss Whedon, which is awesome. Um, so did did Joss your friendship with Joss and like Will Wheaton and all these other guys and Neil Patrick Harris and all the people you worked oh, that's with? That's a lot um, of names you I'm, dropped. I know I, you can pick <laughs> up. Um, I got to bump you up a little bit here. Thank right? you, right? thank you. Yeah. So uh, like, how did these friendships come to be? Because you started filming the Guild in like your tiny little garage and on like no money, right? Yeah, well, I guess uh, the fancy people I know, I've collected over the years for through different ways. Um, Joss Whedon, I um, was randomly hired on a um, for a role on Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, mm -hmm. the last season. They, they hired a bunch of like red shirt girls <laughs> who basically were killed off during the season. So you'd always like get the script on your doorstep and go, am I dead, am I dead? <laughs> oh no, she died, but I'm not dead, yay. I survive. Uh, actually, in the lore, I'm the head of the New York Slayers, so just, I'm not dead, just to be clear, any trivia. Um, I am an actual Slayer. <clears throat> and one day, <laughs> this dude sat down at the table with a bunch of the red shirt girls and was you know, asking us questions. I was like, okay, he seems cool. And then he said something about, well, you know, actresses don't leave. Actors usually don't get um, college degrees. And I was like, excuse me, but I was the valedictorian in my class, and I have a math degree, and I studied music. And he said, okay. And everybody was just like, <laughs> What did she just do? And I, I, I was like, well, I schooled that guy. <laughs> and afterwards, I learned he created the show. He was just that guy. So I was convinced let, next time I got a script on my doorstep, I would be like, oh, dead. <laughs> and killed by a library book on her head, because she's a know-it-all. <laughs> but in fact, he did not do that. He, in fa uh, he actually, because I was kind of an oddball, he embraced, um, I guess, the fact that I'm an oddball, and I got to be part of his sort of Whedonverse, which mm -hmm. is very, it's kind of a tight-knit group of people who socially support each other and just, I mean, he, he has a spirit of family that mm -hmm. I am blessed to be a part of. So I've worked with him over the years in um, Buffy, and I was in Dollhouse, and um, Dr. Horrible, which was a great project, and it was a web series that he did, you know, um, because he was frustrated with his opportunities in Hollywood. That's why I created the Guild, so mm -hmm. there was a, sort of a, a, a link there. And then everybody else, Will Wheaton, I just knew socially, and I was like, I want to create this guy for the guild who's a dick in a kilt, because I love kilt guys, you know, kilt gamers? I'm like, they're kind of hot, but they're like, yeah, aloof. And <laughs> <laughs> it was before beards were popular, I'm like, oh, they're hairy everywhere. Um, uh, so <laughs> I wanted to create this character, and I kind of knew him through somebody else, and I, I, I pitched him, and I took him out to a coffee place that had $8 cups of coffee, and it was like, I'm a high roller. <laughs> that was high rolling for web series, eight dollars. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So basically, the moral of the story is you like hairy guys in kilts, and that's how it all came to be. I'm attracted to them artistically. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So you obviously have, obviously have a good track record of being able to write things that have then become successful. So why, why the book? Why were you like, oh, yay, I'm going to do more things in my life and write this wonderful book? You mean I should talk about myself and then record an audio book where I talk to myself about myself? Uh, that was, yes, it was yes. a weird thing to sign up for. Um, well, I guess the point was after um, I created Geek It Sundry, which was funded and created by YouTube, helped uh, me start my business, which is awesome. Thank you, YouTube. Um, I, uh, I was asked to go around the country presenting my story to a lot of people, either through advertiser meetings or universities or speeches like this at corporations. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I, I was like, I've never done a speech before. So I kind of put together this sort of janky PowerPoint um, slide thing of a lot of the pictures that are in this book right now, um, telling my journey from weird homeschool girl to business owner. And <laughs> since people responded to it and 
at conventions I go to mm -hmm. over the years, people would say, hey, you inspired me to say I'm a gamer at work, even though I didn't ever tell anybody before, or I decided to write a web series because of you, or um, you know, a lot of creativity. I was, you know, I said, hey, this could be useful for people on a bigger scale than just going to speeches like this. So that's why I kind of dived in, and, and also, you know, it was just a creative um, exercise. Uh, I've always wanted to be an author, and it seemed like the right time to sort of encapsulate my story of um, finding success through uh, embracing your individuality. All right. So you seem skeptical. Well, no, <laughs> no I, that was a, a much more complicated answer than I expected. OK, which, I talk a lot. Well, that, that actually leads to my, my next question. The writing style is very, very like stream of consciousness. You're just like, blah, 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 fuck, blah, 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 fuck. Like, like, Don't say I, that, because I tell people, it's great for children. <laughs> Well, children have to learn how to speak like that eventually. It's true. Yeah. Teeth, and, <laughs> teeth and like adults. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. I really, I, throughout the draft, I mean, I, I spent a year on the draft. So it wasn't as if I just like, mm -hmm. here's a book, here, buy it. Um, I spent a long time breaking it down and thinking about each piece as, as far as like, is this useful to someone? Is this mm -hmm. section, is this story something that someone else could take something away from? Or is it just me looking, you know, clever or hilarious? Um, I cut all that out because at the core of it, I, I want this to be a useful book. I want it to inspire people to um, really pursue the things that make them an individual, because um, that's where I think you find success and meaning in this world, as well as just trying to be creative and out of the box without result-oriented behavior. Mm -hmm. Because really, if I hadn't just jumped in and written something for myself, I wouldn't be here today. It wasn't for external goals. It was for just really wanting to tell a story that was mine. And yeah, so that's why I decided to do it. And hopefully people take that away or just you yeah. know read it for Joss Whedon. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine too. At one point you mentioned that, that when you moved out to Hollywood eventually, like after college and, and whatnot, you originally were doing things for like the Hollywood people and whatnot. And then at one point you're like, all of a sudden when the comments started coming in on episode one of The Guild, you're like, holy crap, this is amazing. I want to do things for internet land now. Yeah. No, I went to college when I was uh, just barely 16. So it was clearly, I had a great dating life. <laughs> I mean, it was illegal. I didn't date. So... <laughs> Uh, so my and my mom drove me to college every day. So it clearly, you know, I can't write the next, uh, uh, you know, Revenge of the Nerds because I don't know actually how people partied at college. But I uh, I came from this <laughs> world where achievement was very based on how hard you worked. It was very it was mathematical, and I studied math. It was a mathematical mathematical equation. The harder you worked, the more you achieved. And then I moved to Hollywood, where I was like, hey, I'm enrolled in every class. I have all the headshots discover me and that didn't work because it's a very external based um, world and kind of growing up in a vacuum like I did as a homeschool person I actually didn't I wasn't used to being judged on my appearance for the things that um, people wanted from me mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that I love like math and science fiction and geeky things like video games I think if I were in school I would have been dissuaded from pursuing those or being proud about saying that I love those things because of the way I was born I'm a girl you know the way I look would influence what people uh, expected of me and I found that pressure to be enormous mm -hmm. and I found it to be infuriating and demoralizing and ultimately you know the message of my book is that you have you know you have to change that like you can't you can't influence the choices of your life because of the cliches of the way you were born. And that is something that we need to all strive together to break. Because if we're limited by other people, people's needs for us, then we're selling ourselves short in every way. And that's something that I eventually pushed back against, not like in a very uh, uh, methodical way early on, but by just looking for an outlet to be in control somehow. Mm -hmm. And that's why I picked up a camera and started shooting in my garage. Um, with like $500. <laughs> hey, here's some trash. I mean, there's a whole story about how I put trash in the background of the guild. Literally, if you watch that show, it's all trash in the background. Um, that you picked up literally off the side of the street. Literally off the side of the street. Yeah. Or I would like get wrapping paper and be like, it's a painting, Sharpies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you went to college at 16, you said, which was very awkward. But you're, you've mentioned math several times, which you also majored in violin. Yes, I did. Right, and you got like some deformed thumb, right? I do. It's, it doesn't right? really straighten all the way. It used to be way crooked, and that's why my mom got me into playing when I was two because she saw, you know, Oprah or something and saw all these kids that were two playing the violin, and she was like, well, clearly that's fate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it didn't, doesn't really add up to me either, guys. I don't know. That's my mom, though. She basically was like, don't go to school one day, and I never did. So that's how my mom was. 
who I'm very thankful for because I I basically grew up kind of unfettered and sort of right. followed everything that I was interested in and, and good at things that I never would have been good at normally. But at the same time, you know, growing up in a bubble, it's uh, I'm socially awkward. That's why I love video games because if I'm at a party, if there's not a person there who can talk about video games with myself, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to play a video game. So, <laughs> bye. <laughs> Well, okay, so you were originally accepted to Juilliard, right, at 14? I was. I got into the pre-program, which is like a feeder school for yeah. getting oh, into okay, Juilliard. Okay. But we couldn't afford to move to L uh, New York, and so, uh, j you know, my mom, in a whim, was like, let's go try out for things. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I love her a lot. It's a lot of, there's a story there where she decided to make me a mouseketeer, and she, um, we just drove to Ohio without any reason to drive to Ohio. I was like, where are we going, Mom? And she was like, oh, there's an audition for mouseketeers you're gonna be a Mouseketeer. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't know anything. I don't, I don't know a song. She's like, just sing what you were singing in opera class last week. So I was like, um, you know, singing like a Schubert aria <laughs> to people in a Hilton. And I did not pass the first round, guys, surprisingly. <laughs> Um, but well, you know, she, she put you in a bunch of stuff though, because like trying to socialize you, I guess, right? She really tried. Right. In, <laughs> in the dance, there was like dance class where you were a, a, a famous astrologer. Or? Yes, she tried to make me a Tejano star. This yeah. is all in the book, guys. It's uh, Tejano is a kind of Tex-Mex music that n I should never touch, <laughs> in a in a very offensive way. But she decided, hey, your name, we'll just name you Feliz, you know, Felicia Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I actually have never said that out loud, and I wrote it, but I'm more embarrassed saying it. <laughs> but you know, those kind of whims she would follow and in an effort to just provide any opportunity for my talent, which right, she always right. was supportive of. So she's you know, a wacky person that I love very dearly because I wouldn't be the person I am without her sort of being a little bit crazy. Well, she's, you, you mentioned several times she was like very into just uh, political, political activism, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, no, we, yeah. I remember from the youngest age, um, folding envelopes for like Gary Hart. And he was a guy like 84, I was like probably five or six, you know, I'm folding, she's like, here's how you do it. And I'm like stuffing envelopes for all these loser candidates. <laughs> I mean, she would support anyone who lost, um, but. Ross Perot was Ross the Perot. one where, you know, I was like 13 or 14 and we would go on the road with everybody. We would just like, I would be out there picketing, like, yeah, you know, flat tax. And I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> but um, it was it was definitely amusing. And it taught me kind of uh, being a rabble rouser was fun. I mean, <laughs> we really were just on this corner, like trying to disrupt the world. And I think that really fed into what I do now, which is like disrupting Hollywood is very appealing to me. And the fact that technology gives us all the tools to get our our creations out there on a way more direct way is is very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. But you 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 have a brother, right? Yeah, younger, yep. yeah. And you and your brother were originally in school at a young, young age, right? Um, I don't think Ryan ever went to school. He might have gone to kindergarten. Um, but then my mom got into a fight with a teacher because he held his scissors backwards. And then she was like, I'm out of here. So um, I went to first and second grade, or part of second grade, first grade. And then we just moved and never went to school again. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, literally. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, in I mean, Mississippi, though. in Mississippi, yeah, they yeah. were not good schools and there was reason not to put us in school. But at the same time, there was reason to um, maybe get us tutors, which she eventually did, because my dad was like, what's up with the children? Right. <laughs> 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 so then I began to be trained like a geisha, like she would put me in every lesson possible. Mm -hmm. I took like watercolor with 90 year olds at the community college when I was 12, you know. I, I learned a little bit of every language, including Arabic, because you never know <laughs> what will happen with the world pol political situation. So she, you know, I, I definitely cobbled together an interesting background. And, and like I said, everything that she raised me in a weird way um, that made me feel l different when I got into the world, but have been things that I've channeled into my career today. Mm -hmm. huh. So do you, knowing knowing that, the, that there was like a, a social life, I guess, or a social, um, I guess, structure to being in school, like, looking back on it, do you think you're a little bit any, any different from what your brother went through, having not gone to school at all? I don't think so. I think we were both raised in, you know, pretty isolated world, and our, our one conduit to the world was, um, for me, theater, being like mm -hmm. the fifth, you know, orphan in Oliver, over and over again, wherever I moved, I was like, oh, I loved, you know, Pence and all that stuff, like, that was terrible. Um, 
Okay. Oklahoma, I was like chorus girl number seven a couple times. So that kind of family was very appealing to me mm -hmm. because it gave me social world. And then a dial-up computer. Um, you know, we had a laptop I talk about it in the book. Like, it was this big. It was The laptop is convenient, and it's literally a truck. <laughs> you, have to, you have to have, like, a forklift to move this laptop. And my mom would dial up to CompuServe and just argue with people over Reagan, mostly. Or <laughs> <laughs> and then, But I learned that, hey, this is how you connect to people. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't let me dial up on CompuServe because that was expensive. It was like, I don't know. Six, Hourly. It was out. It was, yeah. yeah, it was like 12 bucks an hour or something. I don't know. Yeah. But then, um, and then we would, then we use like, <laughs> we would play King's Quest and we would use the phone dial up. This is how old I guess I feel right now that you would have to use the phone to get a hint in King's Quest to get through uh, a problem in the game. You couldn't Google anything. And we had like $500 phone bills from trying to get through <laughs> King's Quest. <laughs> so that, we got cut off from a lot of things at a certain point. But um, Prodigy came along, this other online service. That I was love very Prodigy crazy. for Mad Libs. Really? Did you do oh, that? Oh, yeah, I did Mad Libs. They did were great. That, that's crazy to me, because so few people were into that. Oh, they I were... love you. Yeah, of course. Look who I'm sitting on stage with right now. Oh. Yeah. We should, might have been mailbox friends. Oh, gosh. It was, it was so it primitive. Was 25 cents an email. I, yes, yeah. but if you created an extra account that you could write an email to yourself and then leave it in the inbox as a draft, and then somebody else would log in and look at that. That was how hard. <laughs> <laughs> this is the equivalent of, like, I walked 12 miles in snow. Like. <laughs> Left myself yeah, an email right. draft. <laughs> yeah. So throughout the, the early chapters of the book, or talking about your early years, you reference and show images from your diary. Oh, yeah. Which I want to read something here. OK, so in the diary, <laughs> you wrote, do you know what I would like to do more than anything except environmental and biological stability forever in the world? <laughs> I would like to travel in time like in Quantum Leap. It would be so wonderful. Do you, uh. do you still have? <laughs> A, this diary, and B, these thoughts. Well, I have the diary. Um, I don't think that anymore. I mean, there are some crazy things in that diary. And I, I urge all of you to look at yourselves because you probably can make, you can mock yourself as a child. It's very easy for all of us. I think at a certain point I wrote like, and there's startling things in there. You're just like, um, hey, today I learned what a miscarriage was. It's where you spit out a baby early. By the way, today <laughs> I got a beach bag. <laughs> and I'm reading this, I'm like horrified that, <laughs> A, that's how I would learn what that is, and then B, that it was just like, and I got a beach bag. <laughs> um, yes, I had this diary that I talked to because no one else would talk to me. And I talked to a little diary, and it's kind of great to see. That was a very formative period in my mm -hmm. life where I was very sequestered, and after that I sort of you know, branched out a little bit more, but um, having that to reflect on my weirdness is definitely, it's proof that I certainly would have been a social outcast probably right. in school either. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what about like your brother Ryan? What was he doing? Um, he was mostly like uh, he liked to take things apart, and he liked to be on the computer and read. He read a lot of Dungeons and Dragons books. Although my mother wouldn't let us actually play Dungeons and Dragons with someone, either anyone in person, because she thought she read one article once about basement satanic murders, and she was like, "You can't do that." <laughs> So um, grow, fast forward to today, I actually have a company that produces Bad Dungeons and Dragons. Take that, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that Ultima changed your life. Yes. Right, so for those who don't know, what is Ultima? Ultima is like one of the first um, computer role-playing games there is. Uh, Richard Gary created this, and there were, you know, I think eight of them. And I literally thought this was the world I wanted to live in. Primarily because you could create an avatar that looked kind of like yourself. Um, you could play a girl, and you could steal bananas from drawers, all, everywhere. <laughs> like, every single drawer was equipped with fruit that you could take for yourself. And I loved the idea I could steal things. And uh, steal, you know, in a virtual world. Right. Um, of course. It, it, it gave that sense that I was free, and I could walk to the corner without a molester, you know, kidnapping me like my mom told me that would happen. <laughs> I could walk to the corner and kill a monster in the game, and nope, nothing would happen to me that was bad. <laughs> so I love those games, and I connected with people on Prodigy right. um, around that game, and that was really kind of the first really close-knit social group that I ever had, and I tell a story about meeting them, and it's very awkward and funny. There, there, I've got a whole, i got a page of quotes here. I want to read oh. something about Ultima here. Oh, wow. So she says, the early community within Ultima taught me how wonderful it is to connect with like-minded people. No matter how lonely and isolated and starved for attention you are, there's always a possibility in the online world that you can find a place to be accepted or discover a friendship that started with the smallest of interests but then could last a lifetime. Your qualifications for finding a place to belong is enthusiasm and passion, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Thing. So, you had your first kiss out of this. All right, that's an awkward segue. 
Because I felt like the vibe in the room was like, I'm inspired. That's really what tech is about. No, let's talk about my awkward kiss in the back yeah, of an Acura. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I met this guy on, you know, and we had like a phone thing. And I mean, you got to read the book. There's a picture that I sent to boys on the internet, like a physical picture. And they all liked me very much from this picture. It was a terrible, like, kind of glamour shots picture with my butt. Like, bleh. it was, I was wearing like a fringe leather jacket. It's so embarrassing, guys. And anyway, all the boys loved it online. Um, so we decided to meet up in New Jersey, which I'm going to New Jersey later, and I still hate that state because of this incident. That was my next question. Yeah, it's yeah. New Jersey. Sorry, you're always going to suck a little bit. So, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to tell them that to their face. Please don't tweet it to them. Um, <laughs> this is airing everywhere except New Jersey. So Great, safe. thank yeah. you. Yeah. We just geo-blocked. Yeah. Uh, love you, Google. Um, so... <laughs> So basically, I met these guys, and I was kind of like attracted to two of them, and then one of them I got a, uh, just eliminated because I was like, nope, not there. And then I was the other one, nope, not there, but my mom was like, you have to kiss this guy. So she made me kiss him in the back of the car while they went in to get bugles at the, at the Walmart. <laughs> it's a whole story, guys. Just read the book. It's mortifi more mortifying to read it than me talking about it. Not really. And that was my first kiss, and it was gross, and it made me not want to kiss anybody because I was like, that was just sloppy. <laughs> I think most people's first kisses are probably like that. Really? Yeah, mine was. What was your life? Let's hear oh, about you want to talk about mine? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. All right, well, real quick, I'll talk about this. Um, <laughs> it was in Dumb and Dumber. It was the, in the movie? Yeah, in the movie. Okay. Yeah, not filming, but we were there oh, to okay. watch. Oh, okay. I was about to say. <laughs> no, we were there to watch the movie, and she came at me mouth open, full tongue, and I was like, mm, and it just <laughs> went all over. And Ew! <laughs> Why'd she go full tongue? I don't know. We were young. Oh, and with the popcorn and everything? You know, that's like... She didn't throw popcorn at me in the thing, no. Yeah, but just popcorn mouth. You need to clean that out with a wet nap before you can... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay, I will right. tell younger self that, to go back and fix it. I'm sorry about that. That's, it's, all, that's dramatic. It's all right. Yeah. Well, we share that. That's great. Um, <laughs> wet, so, sloppy first. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, young, awkward, homeschooled, of course. I'm um, into college. Uh, still awkward. Um, Thanks. So it's it's all in the book, people. I didn't say it. Um, <laughs> so uh, did you have much of a so? It's okay. Did you have much of a social life in college, or were you just so focused on getting a 4.0, which you are happy to say you graduated? Uh, I was valedictorian in my class. Right. I was. I gave a, a perform. I gave a speech on finding the art in your science. God, I, I hate myself <laughs> in retrospect. Um, you know, I didn't. I had a social life in that the music building was sort of this commune. It was, you know, it's next to the stadium, which gets all the millions of dollars, and then the, it's like the music building. Like, oh, those people are musicians. That supports the band for the Texas, you, you know, football. Mm -hmm. So being a classical musician there, I mean, it was really. I loved it because everybody treated me like a little sister because it was illegal, of course, to date me. So <laughs> everyone was very sweet to me, and I was like the little prodigy, you know, because I was really flashy and I practiced 12 hours a day because I had nothing else to do because no one would date me. So um, I became very good, <laughs> and I joined the Austin Symphony. And I mean, being a part of that world because work was play um, mm -hmm. then because if you were friends with somebody they'd hire you to play at a wedding or um, a depressing you know playing Handel's Messiah for the five millionth time for Easter at some church and you know um, y that was a, a, a social life in a way but it certainly wasn't a, a where I decided I got all those awesome college memories that mm -hmm. most people have I mean I kind of you know wish I had been exposed to crazy keggers you know no one ever invited me to anything just to be perfectly honest <laughs> well, it's sad. So then, so th <laughs> not really. I'm not that sad about it. I mean, a little bit. I really wish I had sex with a lot more different people, just in <laughs> retrospect. Because then, it, don't get that look in your face. You know that that was what college was for. No? There's a time and a place for everything, and that time and place is college. Exactly, yeah. in college, exactly. Yeah. In a yeah. safe way. Don't quote right. me on this. Use, <laughs> be safe, use protection. Thank you. Um, yeah, you don't talk about the love life much, so, you know. I try to keep it clean. Yeah. Um, of course. So the <laughs> everybody's laughing at that. Um, so after college, 4.0 GPA, double majored, awesome, and then all of a sudden you just go move to Hollywood. Yeah. Why? Um, I knew that someone would just discover me on the sidewalk and be like, "You're a star." <laughs> That's really actually the truth. <laughs> I was very naive in thinking that I was going to move to Hollywood and feel like I belonged, um, just like that Oklahoma chorus girl. We were just all going to make a show together. And that did not work out the way I thought it was. I did find a really great uh, career doing commercials um, for like Cheetos and Anheuser-Busch and the post office. And it was always like, hey, I'm a secretary. And half my nose would get on screen and I would make like 
fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, national year. commercials are no joke. They're no joke. Yeah, I made a great yeah. living, but it's literally you're a soulless being. You're like you, they they treat you like cattle. You go in and you're five of you in a row, and you go like, hey, would you like a washer? Next, would you like a washer? And you're just literally. Right. you know, just ejected for your literal outer <laughs> being. And it's it sort of, it was a great uh, way to pay the bills, but not, it was kind of soul searing. And that's kind of what got me into my World of Warcraft addiction, which uh, sort of en enveloped my life as a warlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, we'll get to that. But uh, I want to... That was ominous. Ominous. Well, it's the next section. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I'm kind of going chronologically in the book, which is okay. wonderful. Thank you. And, okay, so your first real gig was ultra low budget serial killers. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when you're when you first move to LA, you do anything, literally anything, and there's a thing called backstage where you send your headshot in any anywhere who will take you. And they're usually like student films with 17 year old, you know, 18 year old kids who don't even have sound on your camera, and um, you're expected to literally beg for any job. And I got my first start and with um, a a movie called Serial Killers, which um, was an audition when the guy asked me to show my breasts, <laughs> and I was like, No, sir, I will not show my breasts. And I felt really good about it. And then he hired me. I was like, OK. But I didn't show my breasts. I was the best friend of the girl who showed her breasts, just for the record. And I treated her with pity the whole time. <laughs> but then the check bounced. The check bounced, yeah. The $90 check exactly. bounced for five days. Yeah, and I uh, guess the, the, the moral of the story is that I, I, I came to Hollywood thinking that my straight A attitude is going to get me far. And it did not get you, me far because that's Hollywood is really more about appearances and luck more than anything. Right. Yeah. Right. So you were going through like the commercial world and the, and the low budget world for like six years, you said, mm -hmm. I think. So why why did you keep going through all of this? Like a lot of people can't handle rejection. I mean, I can't at all. Like I've cried more times in my car than you can count after being, you know, feeling like, hey, I did a terrible job or they judged me and I messed that word up. And um, yeah, it's really hard. And I think growing up homeschooled, I didn't deal with rejection at all because I didn't get exposed to it nearly enough, mm -hmm. which I think is an advantage of being in school. From what I hear, high school is really great for abusing yourself and re <laughs> I mean I'm not envious I watched 90210 I know how those girls act um, <laughs> so I I think that it would have I, I would have been a little more, more resilient but I kept going because I always had this idea that that next job was gonna get me somewhere mm -hmm. right and that's sort of the, the carrot that is dangled in Hollywood that it's just around the corner just keep you know keep going keep going right. and sometimes that's true but for me I just got a, uh, I just got very upset with life and just kept going kind of feeling sadder and sadder inside. Huh. Well, that's a good segue, I guess, into, <laughs> <laughs> into your World of Warcraft addiction. Yeah. Um, this is, so this is where Codex was created. Yeah. Your level 60 warlock. I always call my characters Codex after the Ultima. It's the Book of Infinite Wisdom, because that was what every, it's just really nerdy. So there's an entire chapter, 19 pages, which is 7.3% of your book. About, uh, yeah. About World of Warcraft. Like, that is, I think it's the longest chapter. Um, Did it feel long? No, no, it didn't. I just got done reading it. I was like, dang, other chapters are like a whole timeline. And then this was like just World of Warcraft. Was like, I mean, if you look at the hours spent, it probably was. Well, how much did you play? I mean, I played like 12, 14 hours a day. Like, uh -huh. I would wake up and be like, well, I have a ch I would literally have a to-do list for World of Warcraft. I was like, oh, I need to fly to this place to get Dreamfoil. I need to fly here and make some Pleska the Titans. And then we need to, you know, I would. I was a potion master. I had a lot of responsibility on my plate, OK? <laughs> well, how'd you get into it, though? My brother invited me. And I have been addicted to other online games, Diablo, World of War, I, um, Puzzle Pirates, like all these small online games, um, because I really liked connecting with people and kind of mm -hmm. hanging out with them and playing games. Like, I don't think games are inherently addictive at all. Like, I don't want to. Um, you know, paint them in any negative term. I felt, I feel like I needed a Band-Aid on my life, and I put used the the World of Warcraft as a Band-Aid to fill the hours that I was not happy being a rejected actor over and over mm -hmm. again. I mean, I you know, because the thing was, I made a living, right. so I was just kind of hanging out, waiting to be discovered. Right. Um, yeah. How long did did your brother get as addicted as you did? No, he quit before me. He actually had some self-preservation there. So <laughs> <laughs> I played for, you know, very intensely for eight months at least, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a day. So, um, yeah, it, it got to be the point where I'd dream World of Warcraft. I'd wake up, I'd go and play all day, and I would go to bed with a plan for the next day of gaming, and I would dream in cartoon. And I don't, I, at a certain point, you know, I'm a smart person. I'm like, Maybe this isn't healthy. 
<laughs> um, did you find, so you had another, another guild, right? You found another guild online to play with? Also? Yeah, we, we had a raid. So I quieted an alt. I had a couple of alts because, you know, mm. God knows everybody needs another priest. So I have to get that priest to 60 and that's another thing. And I can, then I can raid every night and that's great. So, cause everybody needs me. <laughs> and, um, it just sort of is a slippery slope, um, because there are always people to play with. There are always people who felt like I, I could provide help to them. Mm -hmm. And it was obviously a false sense of, um, purpose but it was something that made me I needed in my life and it was sort of the quick fix for it. How much do you still play? Do you play at all? I don't play WoW. I, I definitely game a lot. Like I, I game around 20 hours a week. I stream games a couple mm. times a week. I, I mean I produce a lot of gaming and content so um, I still love it a lot and I, I miss you know that sense of camaraderie. I really do because that sense of belonging and working toward a goal together is very fulfilling. Um, I try to find it in filmmaking but it's really fun to take down a monster. It really is. <laughs> So, um, and then uh, during this time, you were also trying to write the guild, right? Well, I quit WoW Cold Turkey because I just started skipping auditions. And at that point, they, you know, the, the lady support group I was in were like, okay, so you're being self-destructive. <laughs> and uh, I quit and I decided to write something. And I wrote, they say, write what you know, something that you really feel like you have something to say about in this world. And that was, uh, that was a bunch of gamers who were interacting online and offline. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was definitely something in my heart I wanted to get on page, which was not easy to get on the page. I had to kind of mm -hmm. force myself, put my you know really uh, put the screws in. Um, but I did finish a whole draft, um, and it was literally the proudest thing I've ever been of been of because I made myself finish something for myself rather than external gratification. So the the lady support group you're talking about all stemmed out of like a love from pancakes or meeting at Waffle House, right? Yeah, yeah. well we just ladies were like let's support each other, and I think later it was the secret that inspired it. So let's not talk about that part of it but <laughs> um, the uh, it was uh, five four or five ladies that got together every mm -hmm. week and would be like these are my goals and this is what I want to do this week and here's what I did this week mm -hmm. and they would do all sorts of productive things and I'd be like um, I raided Zulgarub and we took down uh, <laughs> <laughs> we took the you know we took that Ragnaros and I got a really great hat this week and they would be like I don't understand anything you're doing <laughs> so at a certain point I had enough self-reflection that I was like okay I need to I'm feeling guilty that they are really excelling right. in front of me so what, what were they called? The chicken. It was called chicken. Chicken ladies. I know. Yeah. That was awesome. So vaginal. <laughs> so, so vaginal or magical? So vaginal. Oh, okay. It was magical too. Magical, it's a magical vaginal. vaginal. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the comments came in, series took off. So on episode three was when uh, I was featured on the homepage of YouTube. Yeah, yes. YouTube had this power back then to actually feature content that I wasn't ads. Do. Um. <laughs> I mean, there was a curated front page, the YouTube. Yes, and yes. literally, I wouldn't be here without that one feature. So I definitely owe it to YouTube for kind of skywriting Reckoning the Guild into mm -hmm. visibility. When, when um, that, I think the woman's name was Felicia Williams. She actually curated the comedy for the front page of YouTube back then. And a lot of uh, stars were created from that because that was the only way you could get traffic to be mm -hmm. featured. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, that really was a tipping point where um, people found the show and we, uh, we wanted to make more. We didn't have the money. So we tried to figure it out by uh, putting a PayPal button on those janky WordPress website that I just kind of cobbled together through video tutorials on lynda.com. And I was like, it's beautiful. It was terrible. Um, uh, but I was so proud of it because I made it from scratch. And it was you know, fantastic. I was like, hey, I'll just try this PayPal thing. This was before Kickstarter, too. So I didn't expect anyone to care. And uh, suddenly, we had enough money to shoot more of the episodes. So it was kind of the most empowering thing I've ever experienced to kind of go around that gatekeeper mm -hmm. who was going to allow me to tell a story or not and have the fans support us directly. It was really fantastic. And it actually invigorated me in a way that I felt like, hey, I'm creating a community together with other people. I feel like I'm playing again for the first time hmm. in a long time. And that's why I'm still here doing web content. Right. Uh, because that sense of community and feeling a sense of belonging and making people um, connect and, and accept themselves is really so much more fulfilling than anything external that I could have achieved uh, before. Hmm. So th you you were trying to shop it around to Hollywood execs, though, to actually get it picked up, right? So you had a lot of people, a lot of exec execs that wanted to take over control if they wanted to give any money at all. Like, have you gone back to anybody or met with anybody that originally was just, just horribly mean and, and like, just rubbed it in their face? Um, not rubbed it in their face, but a lot of people were like, oh, it's so great that you didn't sell to us. I've actually oh, had really? people say that because so many times I've seen people option their book or web series and it gets into development and 
you know, the Hollywood process is very lumberous, and there's a lot of external reasons why things get made. And honestly, if anything ever gets made, you should be like, man, victory to you, you can retire. Because it is so hard to turn this boat um, and get anything on camera. So, um, you know, I've, I've been told in the past to people that I just turned down that they were like, yeah, you were right. You did it better than we could have done, even by taking away the rights to your show and kind of controlling everything. And um, that's what I really wanted to protect, because I didn't want to give up the thing that I loved so much mm -hmm. just to make that business move to look fancier for Hollywood because I didn't care as much about pe pleasing them anymore. I really would just want to please our fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's another quote I want to read here um, specifically about the support group. He said, find a support group, find a group to support you, to encourage you, to guilt you into doing. If you can't find one, start one yourself. Random people enjoy having pancakes. Make a goal, then strike down things that are distracting you from that goal, especially video games, unless it's this book, finish reading it, and then start. <laughs> Put the fear of God into yourself. Okay, I'm not religious. Whatever spiritual ideas float your boat, read some obituaries, watch the first, teen, first 15 minutes of Up, I don't care. Just scare yourself good. You have a finite number of toothpaste tubes you will ever consume while on this, while on this planet. Make the most of that clean tooth time for yourself. Well said, thank you. I mean, um, if you think about it, next time you use toothpaste, it's like literally, it's a countdown. It's really depressing. <laughs> That was a long quote too. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I want to I want to take take it down a little bit. Um, so you you mentioned uh, a little bit of like depression and anxiety, like it's sort of a, an underlying theme throughout a lot of the of your adult life into into getting into um, uh, after college and whatnot, and and maybe even during it a little bit. Why why talk about that in the book? Like what why'd you bring that up? I mean, I think that reflecting on a lot of the things that I've done in my life or not done in my life, I feel like there have been um, things in my brain um, ruling me in a way that almost is as much peer pressure as people on uh, to abandon things when you're in puberty. My anxiety and um, uh, problems in my brain made me steer away from things that probably would have been fulfilling mm -hmm. had I not let them rule me. And the fact that I went through such a tough time, um, you know, after Geek and Sundry started, ending the guild, the crushing, you know, just a startup company was, in, I, I wasn't prepared. I didn't have the tools. We didn't scale, we weren't scaled big enough to really handle the amount of work that we had to do. Um, and I wanted to execute. I had a reputation to maintain. I, I had a bar to set that was really high. I had, you know, I was the guild, you know? So when all that came crushing down on my, on my shoulders, I just couldn't handle the stress of it. And I- You are physically ill. I got yeah. physically ill. I have a lot of health problems because of the stress, because stress can kill you guys. And um, it's really, it was, I, I had a nervous breakdown, really. I, I shattered into a lot of pieces. And putting back those pieces um, made me kind of look at my life in a different way and think, hey, I don't want anyone to go through this and feel as alone as I have through this process. Mm -hmm. Because the minute I started reaching out to people and getting their advice and help and therapists and doctors and things like that, like I started to heal. But in the moment, I didn't realize I had an alternative. I didn't know I had tools to like pull myself up from the mud pit. I was like, I'm down here. I don't. I guess I'll just go under. I mean, I really had no, mm -hmm. uh, no awareness. And I think the more people talk about that, especially if somebody likes my work and they see the external things of like, hey, that's what success is, or she has it all, or I want to be like her. Or, you know, I do it with other actors. I'm like, God, it must be easy being Lady Gaga. I mean, I'm sure she wakes up and is just depressed a lot because of all the pressure. And mm -hmm. everyone's got their problems. Uh, that that's the and, and success quite frankly, can bring as many stresses and pressures as failure. Mm -hmm. And nobody told me that ever. I always thought that I was just a broken person not being able to handle all this opportunity I got. And when I started building myself back up and being able to cope a lot better, I wanted to write about it in a very transparent way so that everyone could relate. And if they had any opportunity to be more aware of the patterns in their own life and get help through my story, that would be worth writing the whole book for. Wow, okay. Um, there are microphones in the aisles over here. If anybody has questions, please step up and, and uh, ask. And I'm going to actually, I want to read another quote, which I think is very timely for, for what we just talked about. So about the depression, you said, in the end, I'm able to look back without shame or, reg or regretful nostalgia, and I think you made something great, and something new will come around or not. Either way, do the work you love and love yourself. Uh, that's all you can do in this world in order to be happy. So I, I hope that... Yes, anybody who reading this book will find some inspiration from it because it's, I think, being as open and as transparent as you were about that is probably enough to get a lot of people, like, just a, a little bit to, uh, I don't know how to phrase this, it's, it's very it's personal for me too, um, that uh, it'll allow people to just 
maybe take a little bit of initiative to ask for help that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're, we're greater than just ourselves. And a lot of times, especially growing up the way I did, I feel alone and I feel like I need to be an island mm -hmm. into myself. And being vulnerable to other people and having that kindness repaid and, and, and drawing the strings between yourself and other people is an amazing tool, not only to create, like mm -hmm. the, I would never have created the guild without that chicken group. And I never would have um, stayed in this business without the community around it. And it's and it's really that sort of like safety net of connection between all of us that really catches us when we're most vulnerable and mm -hmm. when we need it, um, and bounces us up when we're buoyant and have or joyous and we want something to share something with the world. Cool. Uh, yeah. Question. Yeah. So you seems like a lot of your work, especially the guild, is about like the way that games can create communities from people from all sorts of different places. And so I'm wondering, like, with the ethics movement that will not be named we see this like it seems recently there's this what seems to me like a theme of like identity being very important in a negative way and i'm wondering if you think that that aspect of gaming that was really appealing to you do you think that's changing where do you think that that pushback comes from i mean i think that um i actually have a chapter of that in the book and you know, I was actually wary of like, do I put this in here? It actually happened after my draft was done. Um, actually, the, the 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 chapter was about negative comments and various attacks I've had on me over the years, especially for the label gamer girl. Um, so that chapter was in there, and that incident that I experienced um, last fall uh, was just almost like an addendum, the the peak of of that sort of underlying movement that had. You're right. It's kind of like a basic resentment or um, intractability about identity of gamer. And because gaming has become so much more than it used to be and expanded to represent a lot more voices and a lot more um, differing viewpoints, um, I think it got to the point where it, was, it, was, it became too big to the, for the umbrella that existed to include everybody. And then people are like, well, I don't feel represented. I don't feel like I fit in here. I love this, but I would love to feel more comfortable this way. And some people just can't bend. They, th they, they feel personally threatened um, by that. And I think it's a tragedy that gaming even has a black eye because of, of, of these people. And to, to this day, I have, you know, daily see people say that I'm afraid of gamers and I uh, alienate gamers. And it's, it personally betrays me because my identity is so close to gaming myself. And um, what I think the good that comes out of it is that, you know, for me personally, the community I have, we try to be as proactively positive as that small minority of people are proactively negative. And that gaming leaders um, come out and say, this is not acceptable, this is not what gaming is. That's not what gaming I, that gaming I know. And I think the more everyone rep steps forward and represents differing points of view and saying, you know what, you can't, you can't do that, that's not acceptable. Um, you know, that really fosters an environment. I think uh, even technologically, Platforms, it's incumbent on pl platforms to give people the tools to moderate their, um, regulate their, uh, their environments. Like to me, YouTube needs to do better to be able to give the tools not only to the creators, but to the community to regulate the environments that they're hanging out around mm -hmm. and the community they create. You know, I started a Twitch channel and that environment gives the moderators so much leeway and we have so many proactive people who created, create a place where I would walk into that chat room in a virtual or physical way and want to meet everybody in that chat room. And everybody can be included if they want to be friendly and inclusive. I wish YouTube had those tools to be able to create a YouTube comment and a YouTube place, a sense of place under those videos that people could feel free to go in and enjoy the company of everybody there. So, um, you know, I think that incredibly negative incident is positive in that gaming is a lot stronger in a unified front against those kind of things. And hopefully platforms and leaders um, stand up and say, you know, let's, let's just focus on the love of games, which I think we all have in our heart. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, on the internet, like no matter how small or how strange uh, something might be, like you, you will always find someone that like, you know, you can bond with, you know, over it. What is the most obscure thing that you or someone that you know have bonded over uh, with, you know, with someone else, and then it just, and then the friendship just like bloomed and blossomed? I mean, I have a love of Anne of Green Gables, <laughs> which is like <laughs> immense. Like I couldn't have been more obsessed. I met Megan Follows and started crying at a certain point because uh, she played Anne of Green Gables in the Disney Channel uh, miniseries. You guys are just blink as hell over here. <laughs> Um, and, and you know, when I say that, a lot of, especially women, are like, oh my god, Anne of Green Gables is my hero, especially redheads. 
So it's like she's the redhead heroine that, you know, we uh, the redhead girls always are like, she's, you know, she is literally my Barbie or whatever. Um, so I think that is something that, and I think, you know, the way that I, I'm talking about Andrew Gables and I'm lighting up with joy. And that's really what should, we should be able to follow. Whatever it is that lights up your joy and talking about it and you meet somebody at the party and you're like, thank God this guy knows about, you know, cool collector sneakers or like, um, you know, Dota or something like that. Like that instantly creates a, uh, creates a connection. That's what I love about geek culture and the way the internet is constructed. Um, there's nothing more tragic than somebody abandoning something they love and lights them up with joy just because the people around you are saying that you're weird or you should hide it. Like that's, you, that's almost a form of bullying in a sense, unconscious bullying, but asking you to conform is a sense of rounding out your corners and dissuading you from letting your joy out. Like that's really all we have in life to, there's a lot of downs, we have to pay bills, you know? Life is inherently kind of crappy sometimes. And the more joy we can spread and connect with other people, the better. And that's what I think the ultimate Pollyanna view of the internet is. Did I answer it? Yes, Anne of Green Gables, thank you. What's your, wait, wait, what's your weirdest thing? Oh. <laughs> Furry? My weirdest? <laughs> Big stuff like you know Doctor Who and you know, yes and yeah and Doctor Who is a good one love Doctor Who but you freaked um, out over Matt Smith right oh I did Matt yeah. Smith's in here yeah. I've seen him at party <laughs> anyway there's a story it's really pathetic <laughs> <laughs> you'll read about it <laughs> yeah. well thank you I can't think of any all right I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot I'm horrible okay bye <laughs> well, what was your first kiss no no okay when was your uh, first kiss <laughs> we want details was it juicy uh, yeah question. Hey, when I think of kind of five-minute video content, like content, episodic episodes, like The Guild, uh, The Legend of Neil, I kind of think of you, but I haven't really seen it become popularized in any way. And I wonder if you had any ideas why it's not happening. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, you know, I think uh, early in Geek at Sundry, I tried to maintain that kind of content. And unfortunately, if you know things about film production is that anything scripted is extremely difficult. Um, if you walked on the set of the Guild, most fans were like, oh my god, I thought it was just, just you and a camera. You can't, you know, Supernatural, a show that I was on for four seasons, that's 300 people work on that show. So the scale of making scripted content, especially at volume, is exorbitantly expensive and advertising dollars just haven't been able to be there to prove it. So say you have an investment um, into like Geek at Sundry and you have minute, minutes that you need to make of content. What is a better investment uh, in, a, in a practical way? $100 a minute or $1,000 a minute? If you don't have the advertisers out there to, to, to really support this brand new kind of content. Well, you have to make cheaper content, right? And then you have these vloggers who are amazing and they have one camera and they're making $2 million a year on product placement and they literally do have a camera on themselves. And what is a better economic landscape? Mm -hmm. Well, the Guild is a great economic landscape in that it's an IP that can be exploited on different properties. I can make a movie one day. I licensed it to video games and board games and t-shirts and things like that. That has a long life. So that IP, look at Star Wars, you know? That's the biggest, but it's a much more risky inve uh, investment because you don't know if you're going to make your money back. Um, better to just make lots of low-budget content. And I think after the Guild and Legend of Neil, there was kind of a potential of like, hey, short-form scripted is going to be it. And a lot of things tanked. So then you went the safe route and you invested in low-budget content, which is now more popular. And they, those stars that are being um, created now on those platforms are now funding long-form scripted content. Mm. So it's kind of this weird cycle. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that long-form long scripted, especially YouTube is investing in it, which is amazing, um, and all sorts of other platforms like Vessel, and you know everyone's making scripted content now. So it seems like the pendulum went one way and now it's coming back. But the short form is just harder to license in different iterations across platforms. It's a bunch of wonky business stuff that basically is like make a movie or make really cheap content. That's kind of where web video is right now. <laughs> but who knows in five years? You never know. That's the cool thing about this space. Yeah, we have time for one more question. I actually have just a really lighthearted question. Actually. Oh, good, because that was uh, boring, what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a mom of an eight-year-old and we, sh girl, and we both game together. And oh. we have theme songs for ourselves to like when we win. And my daughter asked me to ask you, what is your winning dance or theme song? Oh, my oh. gosh. <laughs> you know you have to get up, right? I mean, my... my Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> you can dance for me. It's probably Eye of the Tiger. Um, or take these broken wings and fly again. It's like my karaoke song. I just have to rub really bad 80s songs in people's faces. Um, 
yeah, that's probably my answer. That's a terrible phone. Anyway, that's, <laughs> but that's the cutest story I've ever heard. Thank you Thank for you. that. <laughs> well, so, so you've got the wonderful book out. You've got Geek and Sundry. So what's next for you? Um, I'm working on a lot of different projects. I, I'm trying to get back to more scripted content. You know, the business has really taken a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. The book took up last year, and now I'm working on a TV pilot, whether it's digital or TV. That's cool. I'm working on something to direct, and hopefully, you know, making another long-form piece of content that's scripted. is That's really what I love, and just keeping all the platforms juggling on Geek and Sundry, YouTube, and everything that we do. So, I mean, I love having 15 hats, and although it tends to break my neck because of the heaviness, I just can't stop. <laughs> Well, um, you did mention that you, you do keep all the gifts that people ever give you. <gasps> so um, we, we got you this wonderful Toxic Google Android. What? Yes. Did you get this free somewhere? I'm just kidding. I, Is it a re-gift? It's OK. I want I, it. No. We, Thank we you. Get, we give them to our guests. It's really sweet. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. It's but adorable. I give, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm sorry. That so, was really tacky. <laughs> Thank you. Is it free? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you're never weird on the internet, almost a memoir available. <laughs> comes out today, right? It comes, it's out today, guys. Today, it is out today. It is there in the back, if it, there still are any copies, I don't know. Um, on Amazon, and of course, Google Play. Uh, get your copy, pick up one if you haven't. Um, so, thank you for coming out, everyone. Please help me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful.